Okay, the first five weeks of this class, first third of this class, is sort of giving us the background knowledge you need to tackle the second two thirds of the class. All right? Uh, because at this point, we really get sort of to the main event of the class. All right? We sort of get to the, um, the, the real point of this class. What we've done so far, you know, of course, is necessary and it's valuable skills to have, and we'll use them. Um, but really, as the name of this class implies, web database integration, the biggest work in this class is, is creating a data driven website or a database driven website. What I mean by a database driven website is that data comes to populate the web pages from a database. Stuff isn't hard coded like you might have in a static website. So database websites are a kind of dynamic website, probably the most common kind of dynamic website. I guess there's other kinds of dynamic sites too. But for the most part, when you think dynamic websites, you're thinking of database driven websites. So in other words, there is not a individual product page for every single product on Amazon. All right. There is instead a generic product page that gets the details filled in with values from the database. Uh, there is not a page that hard codes all the categories of items, for example. Those categories are pulled from a database to show books, music, videos, and so on down the line. Excuse me. So that's what we mean by database driven. So what we're going to do is we're going to sort of take a path where we talk about database design, talk about database concepts and design, we talk about SQL statements, and then we implement them in ASP.NET. So we're not going to spend like, we're not going to do all our discussion of database theory then do all of our discussion of SQL, and then do our ASP.NET. We'll do sort of a little at a time of each of those topics. Um, so we reinforce the concepts that you probably already have. Uh, how many of you have taken the Database 143 course? All right, all, all right, everyone. So you've at least heard this information once, and, and maybe, you know, maybe you have a good recall of it. Uh, maybe it's been a while, and you need a little bit of a refresher. Uh, you know, this is one of these things like any other skill where if you don't use it, you're, you're not going to remember it very well. So this first part will be uh, a refresher for database topics, you know, database terminology, basic database topics, database theory, and then we'll get into the SQL and the ASP.NET side of things. First of all, how would you define a database? What makes a database different than other kinds of data that you might have? How it's organized. Organized, okay. And that's good. Because sometimes it's hard even for me to give like a definition, like a definition like you'd read in a dictionary. But it's oftentimes easier to describe things, to talk about some of the qualities that it has. And from that, we might be able to form in our mind a good idea of what the concept is. So one thing about a database is the manner in which it is organized. So it's not just a pile of data, all right? It is data that is organized in a certain way. How is it organized? So there's no repeating data. Okay. Organized, so no repeating. The other word people use a lot for that is redundant data. Can you give an example of what redundant data would be? students listed with their counselor's email or something, 
where you would have to type the same like email for every student instead of just like linking it. Okay, that's a good example. So let's say, for example, we had some data about the students. I'm going to expand on your example just a little bit. But let's say we had data about a student. And we had the student name. And then we had the counselor's email. The counselor's name. counselor's office. And let's say this person happened to have the same counselor. Then maybe we had a third student who had a different counselor, fourth student who had the same, who also had Pete the counselor, and so on down the line. What's wrong with redundant data? The word redundant is like sort of bad most of the time. I won't say it's bad all the time, right? We'll talk, a, you know, but, but as far as data storage goes, it's generally thought of as being bad. All right, because it, it sort of means, you know, repeated with no added value. All right, so, uh, and in fact, it's not even that there's no value, it's that it's, it can be detrimental. So what's wrong with having data stored like this, where for each student, you store all the information about the counselor? Yeah, number one is there's a chance of inconsistency. If something changes, everything needs changed for that person. So if Pete the counselor moves to a different office, then you have to change it here. have to change it here, and so on. So, okay, what's wrong with that? Probably a lot of students could change. A lot of students could change. And what happens if you don't get that correct? All right, what happens if you don't get, if you don't change every related thing? You're gonna have inconsistent data. So I could run one report, let's say, and say that Pete the counselor is in BU 112, I could run another report and say that he was in BL 108, all right? You're not going to have that if Pete the counselor's information is stored only in one place, right? Might be wrong, but it's going to be consistent, right? And inconsistency is, is uh, the potential for inconsistency is a giant problem in terms of storing data because you want the same uh, you want to be able to get the same results no matter how you go after the data all right and in this case well you you know if there was someone way down here and for some reason they weren't updated would have Pete back in Bass Library 108 and that goes for any of these other people as well, any of these other fields as well, right? You could spell Pete's name wrong. You could, you know, you could put in, uh, I thought that was Joe, I didn't realize it was Pete, and they, then the people have different names, whatever. There's just a potential for all kinds of inconsistency when you have redundant data, all right? Um, another problem.
problem with, redu with redundant data. Space. It takes up space without adding any value. All right. Some of the things that we talk about we, we, we can do when we talk about creating databases take up more space. Databases typically do take up a lot of space. All right. However, it's space that is taken up with a good reason, with benefits. All right. There's a reason why we store things in databases, even though they take up more space than files like this, which are typically called flat files, files where things exist sort of in their own silo and they're not clearly related to other data. All right. Um, let's, let's back up just a little bit because the inconsistency thing and getting value for the space that you take up reminds us what we want about, out of our database in the first place. What's the whole idea of information technology? Notice it says database. Data and information In normal conversations, people use those interchangeably, right? You know, I need to find out the data for my doctor, like their phone number, their address, or whatever. Or I might say I need to find the information about my doctor. So ordinary people, when they discuss the words, when they use the words data and information, they interchange them. They use the same word. To, they use both words to mean the same thing. But in information technology, They mean different things. What's the difference between data and information? Data is raw facts. Data is raw <coughs> facts. All right. What's information then? It tells a story about those raw facts. It tells a story. That's an excellent way to put it. It gives us the data that's organized a certain way, that is summarized a certain way, that's filtered in a certain way. And the idea is, is it tells us a story. It gives us insight into a particular problem. The example that I use all the time is, let's say a company had $15,000 of sales last month. All right? For the month of August, Company ABC had $15,000 worth of sale. Was that a good month? Who knows, right? That's data, right? But we can't make any conclusions out of it. If it was, if the, if the company was my photography business that I ran out of my garage, and in July, I sold $10,000, and I went up to $15,000, we're cracking the champagne, right? We had a great month, all right? If that company is Microsoft, and their sales for October were $15,000, there's going to be a lot of depressed people. You know, stock markets are crashing. You know, people are getting fired, you know. Bad things are happening if that was the case, right? So a raw fact in itself doesn't give you any doesn't give you any insight into a situation. You need to take that raw fact and do something to it to transform it into information. So in the case of my company that sold fifteen thousand dollars worth of stuff, what might allow me to come to conclude some conclusions? What other pieces of data? might allow me to come to some conclusions about whether 15,000 was a good month or a bad month. You already alluded to a couple of things, or one thing probably. What are some other things? The one thing that I alluded to is you could compare with the previous month, right? If 15,000 was more than 10,000, well, that's probably a good month. On the other hand, if Microsoft went from 10,000 to 15,000, it's still pretty disastrous, right? What are some other things that we could look at in deciding if $15,000 is a good month? Their costs. Their costs, right? 
If you sold $15,000 $15, worth of goods and your cost was $20,000, even a small business, that wouldn't be a good month. All right? If you sold $15,000 and your cost was $12,000, well, that might be an okay month. If it was $7,000, wow, that was probably a pretty good month, and so on down the line. So in transforming data to information, that's what IT is, right? Information technology. We do a lot of things to transform data into information. One of the things we do is we match it up with other data. So we compare our September sales with our August sales. We compare our sales with our expenses. Maybe we compare our sales with budgeted data, right? Maybe we're a Halloween store, all right? And we don't normally sell much in August because people aren't really thinking about Halloween in August. But in September is one of our big months. So we may have sell more in September than August, but that still might not be a good month, right? Because normally we sell twice as much. And maybe we only sell sold 50% more. So it really depends. And so maybe what we do is we compare with our budgeted amount. Maybe we expected to sell $20,000 worth of stuff, and even though we went from ten dollars to $15,000, $15,000 isn't good because we expected to sell $20,000. Maybe we compare against our competitors, right? Um, it could be that it's just a bad month economically, and maybe we didn't have a good month, but some of our competitors did even worse. All right, you know, maybe we lost money, but other competitors lost a ton more money than we did. All right, that's another thing to do. So one of the things that we do is we match up with other data. That helps us transform data into information. It's interesting to notice that back in the old days, when I like was going to college back then, a lot of people called this field data processing. Okay, and you might have even heard the term data processing. Whereas now most people call this field information technology. Why do you think people call it information technology instead of data processing? What's the difference between those two names? Yes. Information is more how you interpret the data and sort of uh, you can cobble data together to sort of get like a okay. impression. That's definitely true. So why would that affect the name? Why is information technology maybe a better name than data processing? Because we use it uh, a more diverse scale than we did uh, several years ago. Probably. We probably use data more different ways. The other thing I would add to that is the goal isn't just to process data, right? The goal is to get some information from that data. So therefore, it's like, you know, uh, this is probably a ridiculous example. This, yeah, I, I shouldn't have classes like right before lunch because then all my examples are food examples, right? But like, if I had a cake sitting there, or, 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 or let's, let's put it this way. If I was about to make a cake, I would say I'm about to make a cake. I'm a baker that bakes cakes. I would not say I'm a person that combines egg, flour, sugar, and other ingredients and puts them in the oven, right? Information technology, that phrase focuses on the results, focuses on what we want out of it, not what we do to get it, all right? So the focus really needs, you know, keep your eyes on the prize, keep your eyes on the expected outcome, what we want, and we want information, all right? One way we can get information is to match up with other data. There's other ways that we can get information too, right? We can summarize data. Um, let's say, um, 
the president of the college wanted to know um, wanted to study and find out maybe what high schools we should visit to recruit students. All right. What information might help the president of this college to figure out what cities that we might want to visit the high schools in? The amount of students from high schools here now. Exactly. What high school did you go to? Bay. Bay. What high school did you go to? Firelands. Okay, Firelands. Does it matter to the president that this one person went to Bay and this one person went to Firelands? Do we need the names of everyone that went to Bay and the names of everyone that went to Firelands? No. For the purpose that they're using it for, all right, um, they wouldn't necessarily need the individual pieces of data. But summarized data would be great if we looked at that and maybe we compared how many students graduated from that high school versus how many students we have from that high school. So we could see if we, if last year 500 graduated and 250 came here, that would say one thing. If we had another college where 500 graduated and only 50 came here, well, that might be a better opportunity for us to recruit. All right? So we're matching up with other data, and we're also summarizing. All right? Another thing that we can do with data is we can look for exceptions. All right? We can look for exceptions. With exceptions, we don't necessarily look at every piece of data. We look for things that are outside the ordinary. All right? So, getting back to our high school example, maybe we only look for high schools where less than 25% of the students came here, or less than 10%. I don't know what a reasonable number is, so I'm just making up numbers, right? But maybe we have a certain number in mind, and we look for high schools that have less than that percentage. That's exception processing. We're not looking at every data, every piece of data, but we're looking for uh, data that is outside of the normal realm because that's an opportunity to work for it. Uh, if I was a manager, let's say, of the Ohio region, all right, and I had offices, you know, in most of the big cities, you know, Toledo, Cleveland, Lorraine, Elyria, uh, Columbus, Cincinnati, Dayton, and so on. I might not have time to study everything about every office. So I might do exception reporting and see what office was most profitable, what offices were least profitable. The offices that aren't profitable, I might not pay a lot of attention to them, right? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Whereas if I noticed there were other offices that were less profitable or even losing money, I might spend a lot of time working with them and trying to figure out what the issue was. So again, we can get exceptions. Now this is all well and good. We could probably think of other things, other ways that we can take this raw pile of data and transform it into something usable. Another word, I don't really like this word, but I guess it is sort of a good word, is actionable. Inform information typically is actionable. What do we mean when we say information is actionable? Sounds like a made-up word. That's why I don't like it. But it is a good concept. Anyhow, what does actionable mean? Yes? You're able to use information to make decisions or some sort of action. On right. You can do something with it. All right? You can do something with it. All right? Um, I guess we could think of information that isn't actionable, you know. Um, Trying to think of a good one. 31% um, of LC students are above six foot tall. All right? That might be information, right? Is raw data. We took the raw data, individual students and their heights, 
and combined it. But, I don't know, what does that mean? What could we do? Maybe we could use that to tell the bookstore what t-shirts to stock? I don't know. So, but for the most part, for a college, that really isn't something that you could do anything with. All right? So actionable, on the other hand, a certain percentage of students come from this city or come from that city. That might be something we could do something with. Maybe if we see that a small percentage of students come from a certain community, we could step up our efforts to recruit in that community. All right? That's information that's actionable. We can do something with that information. Now, a couple things to remember about this transformation is that, number one, the oldest acronym in computer science. Can anyone take a guess at what that is? Old, an acronym is like initials, like NASA's National Aeronautics and Space Administration. What's the oldest acronym in computer science? Does anyone know? Okay, you're going to force me to do this. I have a nice shiny quarter to anyone that can tell me what it is. The oldest acronym in computer science. I.O. I.O.? I don't know. Okay, you know what? Uh, there's not actual statistics on this, all right? So we'll give you a quarter anyhow. What the heck? Thank you. Yeah. That will be bad. And if you get like eight other ones, you could buy a cup of coffee, right? The one I was thinking of is GIGL. Does anyone know what that stands for? It stands for garbage in, garbage out. So, if my collection of student data isn't accurate about where the students come from, all right, isn't accurate, and there's a lot of blanks maybe, because the data wasn't validated, let's say. That would be horrible, right? Horrible IT practices, but let's just hypothetically say that. And let's say that we didn't have a drop down for the community, but people could type in anything they wanted to. So someone could misspell Lorraine, or someone could spell Wellington wrong, or typo, or whatever. And my data wasn't very good, guess what? The information that comes out isn't going to be very good. You know, you can't take, it's, it's like making a cake with bad ingredients, right? If the eggs are rotten and the milk is sour and the flour is moldy, that's disgusting. <laughs> All right? I'm making myself sick up here talking about this. But the bottom line is you're not going to make a good cake out of bad ingredients. You're not going to get good information out of bad data. So that's the first consideration, that we want to make sure the data is good. The second one is a little more subtle. All right? That should be pretty obvious. All right? You probably... If you didn't know that, you probably could have guessed that if you sat and thought for five minutes, right? The other consideration, though, is notice the different ways that we can transform this data and information, all right? There's a lot of different ways. We can match up with other data. What kind of other data? All kinds of other data. We can summarize it in a bunch of different ways. I'm going to spell that, but my handwriting is so bad you can't read it. All right? And we can look for all kinds of exceptions. So, second thing to remember is the more flexible. That you can pro the more flexibility you have in processing data, the better your information is going to be. All right. 
So the more different ways you can combine data together and view data this way or view data that way or combine it this way or combine it that way or summarize it this way or summarize it that way, the more flexible you are with this, the better off you're going to be, the better your information is going to be. Uh, usually with companies, you have two kinds of queries that are run. You have like regular queries. Queries are simply essentially asking the database for data, asking the database for some information. So they're sort of regular queries. You know, a company every month runs a profit and loss statement, right, and runs a balance sheet. They do that like clockwork. Every, accounting, every company's accounting department produces those monthly reports every single month. There might be weekly reports that are run, the weekly sales summary or something like that that's done all the time. And those are sort of to help the organization do um, its normal everyday tasks. There also is, however, uh, strategic data that's done on an ad hoc basis. All right? And what that is, is where you go in and you say, as the, the, the administration of LC might have done a few years back, and said, we want to make some satellite campuses. Where would be a good place to put them? You know? I hope, and I'm sure they didn't, just take a map of Lorraine County and throw a dart at it, and oh, that one hit in Wellington, that one hit North Ridgeville, and the third one hit Lorraine, right? I doubt they did that. I doubt, uh, instead, they likely looked at some data that they pulled from the database and came to some conclusions about what the best places to put them would be. What would be the best programs to offer there, and so on. All right. Now, that's not something you're going to do every week, every month, even every year, right? It's something that you're going to do when you need to do it. So that's kind of ad hoc data. Bottom line is, more flexible you are, in being able to combine your data and manipulate your data, the better information you're going to get. Now, what does this have to do with anything? All right? What does this have to do with where we started at? Did I just go off on a tangent? Well, sort of. But it is relevant. Because we talked about redundant data in this case. And we said that having all the information about the counselor for every student that has that counselor is redundant. What is the problem with redundancy? Well, one of the problems is, is that it leads to inaccurate or inconsistent data. It leads to garbage going in, and therefore, we're more apt to get garbage coming out. Relational databases actually address both of these issues. They address the quality of the data, the quality of the raw materials, all right? And they address the flexibility of generating stuff from a database. So redundant data has a bigger risk of having inconsistencies than not redundant data, where everything is stored only in one place. That essentially is the goal of relational databases, that every piece of data is stored in only one place. Now, Today, or maybe next time, we're going to talk about uh, normalization and stuff like that. And there's all kinds of rules for normalization, and, and we could go over examples and all that. The whole point of normalization is exactly that, though. Every piece of data is only stored in one place. All right, so databases are organized, so there is no repeating data. Does so anyone want to add to that description of databases? Okay. All right. One of the things is, is the data in databases isn't just in a big pile of data. This is a big pile of data, right? Because it contains student and counselor information all smashed together into one pile. Instead, databases are stored... And this also deals with organization, by the way, the previous point. 
But databases are stored where entities different entities are stored in different tables. All right? Pieces of information are not stored in one giant pile together. They each have their own place. And those places are called tables. All right? Now, entity and table are two words that kind of mean, kind of refer to the same thing, but they're like looking at it in two different directions. When we talk about an entity, uh, we're talking about, uh, when we're talking on very conceptual terms, you know, what are the entities in a school? Well, there's teachers, there's students, there's um, classes, there's degrees, and so on. Those are all entities. Uh, a simple way to think of an entity is to think of nouns when you're describing a problem. All right? Uh, oh, I wish I had the projector up. I would play the Schoolhouse Rock thing. Does anyone remember the Schoolhouse Rock about nouns. Oh my goodness. If I had a piano, I would sing it. No, I'm just kidding. I wouldn't sing it no matter what. It's quite interesting. A nouns, a person, place, or thing. All right, look it up. All right. So, when you're talking about a problem, the nouns, the people, places, and things that stick out are probably your database entities. Now, you have to take that with a little grain of salt but it's a good starting point, all right? So, if I knew nothing about colleges and I was doing a database for a college, I know that's kind of odd, but let's pretend, all right? I would ask a person, well, what, what, you know, what goes on here at, at a college? And they would probably say something like, you know, well, a college is where students come and take classes. Those classes are taught by faculty members. Uh, when they accumulate enough classes, uh, they will get a degree in their major. All right? And of course, they go on and describe it a lot more, right? We don't have enough information to build a database yet, right? But we got a pretty good start at some of the entities in the college. Pick out the nouns, students, faculty, classes, degrees, majors, all right? Those would all likely be tables in the database. So when you're talking about them in sort of an abstract way, you call them entities. When you actually talk about putting them in databases, uh, you're talking about tables then. So that's the, sort of the different slant of an entity versus a table. Now. That's a true statement that different entities are stored in different tables in the database. All right? What else can you tell me sort of about that concept? Yes? Uh, uh, no two tables will have the same exact information on them. Okay. No two tables will have the same information. That's another way of sort of saying, uh, talking about the redundancy issue. Yes. They have relationships. Between ah, each other. they have relationships between each other. All right, and that also helps get rid of the redundancy, and that also helps with the combining of data between different things. All right, so we can look at this data combined with that data easily. Right. Think of. The old way of, of storing data is being like a series of unrelated Excel spreadsheets. All right? That's kind of what flat files were. Now, I know you can do some really crazy things in Excel. We're not talking about that. We're talking about just a basic standalone Excel worksheet. And there might be a worksheet for customers, and there might be a worksheet for sales, and there might be a worksheet for sales reps. And there might be a worksheet for commissions and so on. It was very difficult to combine things together in that scenario because you might have inaccurate data. 
In other words, you might have a sales that has an incorrect cu uh, customer and sales rep number associated with it. All right? Or you might have a sale for a sales rep that doesn't exist. Or you had to write a program to match up the sales with the customers and the sales reps and the inventory items. And that was not necessarily straightforward logic. You'd have to like sort of write your own code to match these things up. And it was very fallible code that could easily go wrong. Whereas in database, not only do we have these entities, but we have the entities and the relationships between those entities. Give an example of a relationship from a relational database. Yes? Uh, primary keys and foreign keys. Primary keys and foreign keys. Very good. Give a specific example of one. Just make up uh, some tables. Excellent example. So, two of the entities that we have on campus are we have a class and we have a faculty member. Now, there might be information about each of these. For the class, maybe the name of the class. Maybe the days that it meets, time, room. I'm doing sort of a simplified version of this, okay? You know, so you could easily, you could find flaws with what I'm doing here, but just go with this. There's a class number. There's a section number. Now, each of these classes is taught by one teacher, all right? And the teacher is going to have a faculty name, a faculty first name, last name, office, email, office hours, etc. So this is all the information about a faculty person, this is information about all the class, all the classes. But right now, they're, they're not related. Now, how would we relate these together? What will be an example of how we would relate these together? What do I need to change here? There's no mention of faculty over here, and there's no mention of classes over here. So how would I relate them together? Okay. We could put a faculty name on the class table, and that might work. Might not work. Why not? Why do I say it might not work? It's not. But sure, like it's just one to only faculty is matching with class, and class isn't matching with faculty. Uh, not quite. There, there's a more fundamental reason why. Putting a name of the faculty person here wouldn't work. Someone with the same name. Two people with the same name, right? You know, so back a few years ago, I don't think they still are, but there were two teachers named Blahnik. One was taught accounting in my division, and one taught something in science. Uh, right now, I think someone and their brother teaches here. So there's two people that have the same name. Well, you might say, <laughs> all right. Make it the first and last name. Well, could be someone with the same first name and last name if it was a common name. So how do we get around that problem? It was alluded to in the original answer. You create like a teacher ID? We create an ID number. So I could create a faculty ID. And I would not store them the faculty name, first name, last name, or both of them, or whatever, I would store the faculty ID number here. And now these two are related. The original answer contained a couple of terms that 
it, that, that we have up here now, we just haven't identified them. One thing, one of the terms was a primary key. And one was a foreign key. And usually when I write it out, I put one asterisk next to a primary key, one asterisk next, or two asterisks next to a foreign key. What can we say about a primary key in a table? It identifies. It identifies. Okay. That's very true. Can someone describe a little more detail what that means to identify? It's unique. It's unique, right? If you could imagine a uh, student ID, how many people have the same student ID as you? No one. Right? What would be the problem with that? Well, um, you took a class. Who gets credit for it? You or them. Who pays the bills? You or them. All right? Who gets the degree? You or them. Right? If we're going to relate things in databases using the keys, then that key, that primary key, better point to only one member of that entity. All right. So faculty ID better be unique, because if there was someone else that had the same faculty ID as me, who's going to teach this class? Wouldn't be clear. All right. Who's going to get paid for this class? Wouldn't be clear. So we have to make sure that the primary key is unique, which means that no two members of the entity have the same value of their primary keys. Okay. What's the second rule about a primary key? It's related to, to being unique, sort of. It might be so obvious that you can't think of it. There's only one. Well, there's only one. Well, generally. Uh, I'm not going to say that because it depends how you, what your database is. You can have a combination of things as a primary key. We'll talk about that in a second. Did you have an answer? Just one row? Uh, not necessarily. Everything will relate to every, prime, every row will have a unique value. That's true. Every primary key relates to just one row in the database. Yes? It should, it should be an attribute that uh, clearly identifies each specific uh, okay. record. You're all right. You're all, you're all right, but you're all saying just wording that they're all unique, diff, you know, just using different words. The other characteristic is every row has to have one. There is no, you're not allowed to have a primary key with a blank or no value for the primary key. Not even one, all right? So I can't say, well, this person's student number is, or faculty number is null. No, can't do that. So every member has to have one, and it has to be unique for every row. You can't have a combination of things as being a primary key. Uh, for uh, an example of that um, would be, uh, I'm trying to come up with an example from real life. Let's say the course number here at LC. What's the course number for this course? CISS 243. You could store that as two separate fields. The department and the course number. CISS 243. In fact, there would be advantages to doing that, right? Because you could easily make sure that the first four characters matched the table of departments. Whereas if you had it as one giant seven character thing, it wouldn't be easy to do that. So, courses here have a four character department code and a three character number. All right. Both of them together are what is unique. In other words, there are several accounting classes, right? Accounting 151, 152, for example. So, accounting, ACCT or whatever it is, is not unique because there's a bunch of accounting courses. 
Now, another department may also have a course numbered 151. Uh, like, I think, economics. There's an econ 151 and 152 also. So that number is not unique because there's an accounting 151 and an econ 151. However, the combination of those two, those two things, the department plus the course number, is unique. All right? So there is no, there, there is only one course that is econ 151, the combination of those two. And there's only one course that's accounting 151. All right? One thing that we often do is we use what's called an access, an auto number field. One is automatically generated. All right? And that will guarantee that no two things have the same thing. So like the next, like student number would be an example of that. The next student that comes in gets the next student number available. So if the last student that enrolled was 641729, the next student is going to be 641730, and so on. All right? So sometimes you use an auto number field, one that's just automatically numbered. So that's a primary key. All right? That's a primary key. So, in our case, we have a faculty ID. And that's probably going to be a number. Very well might be an auto number. The next faculty person we hire will probably get the next number, all right, on the list. In this case, it's single part. Um, you're not wrong in saying that most of them are going to be single part. A lot of them will be, but I don't want to sort of make that as a point because you can have multiple part primary keys. Now, what about the faculty ID number in the class table? That is called a foreign key, right? Here's a rule about a foreign key. A foreign key in one table always matches up with a primary key in another table. Always matches up. Because what's the purpose of a foreign key? The purpose of a foreign key is to define which one faculty member teaches this class. So I have to use a faculty ID to do that. Could I use the faculty office number instead? No, you might have two faculty members that share an office if space gets tight, right? So if I stored the office to link the class to the faculty person, that might not be correct, right? And therefore, um, it's not going to work. In the case of adjuncts, adjuncts don't have an office. So how could you link and say this adjunct was teaching this class? It would be problematic. But even adjuncts have a faculty ID. So therefore, you're always going to use a primary key from one table to link to what's called a foreign key in this table. When you define a foreign key, you are saying that the value of this field has to match up with one value in this table. In other words, if the faculty numbers, if, if there were three faculty at this college, Mike, Doug, and John, only three faculty at this college, you could not enter a class that had a faculty number of four in it. You just can't do it if it's defined as a foreign key. If that foreign key relationship is, exists, you simply cannot put it in. The database won't let you. By hook or by crook, as the old saying goes. And here's the interesting thing. That will work across applications, right? So I create an ASPX application, a web application that tries to add classes to the database. 
and you create a desktop application that tries to add classes to the database. And someone else creates a mobile application that tries to add classes to the database. Doesn't matter who creates the application, you will not physically be able to insert a row in this table that has an, an invalid foreign key. That is, something in this column that does not match up with one of the values in that column. And that's nice that it works that way, right? Because each one of us may have different skills as programmers. And maybe you did a great job validating, but I didn't do such a good job validating. So I might let bad data slip through and try to get into the database. Guess what? The database won't let it. All right? So the database management system, the software that controls the database, is sort of the gatekeeper of the database. And no matter how you try to write it, you're not able to get bad data past the database management system. So that's great, right? So that means I can't have a non-existent professor teaching the class. All right? That's good news, right? Because if I did have a non-existent teacher teaching the class, first of all, who's the paycheck going to? All right? Secondly, my data is not accurate, right? If I ran reports that looked at teachers and classes, I had bad data, so I'm getting bad information out of it. So this foreign key constraint helps make sure the data is good and clean. So we've achieved one of our goals for getting good data, that we have good data. Uh, or one of our goals is getting good information, that we have good data. The second thing is, is by storing these things in different entities that are related together, we can combine data in all sorts of different ways. The problem if you look at data like, let's say, an Excel worksheet. If you have data in an Excel worksheet, it might do a great job showing what it was built to show. But it might be very difficult to take and show that data in a different way. All right. Now I know some people can do great things with Excel, but still, it's not very straightforward to take a data that shows one thing and combine it with other data or filter out or whatever. In relational databases, because each entity, each piece of the puzzle is stored in its own table and those tables are linked together through relationships, it becomes easy to combine data in all sorts of ways. All right? And therefore, the flexibility that exists in queries for relational databases far exceeds the flexibility that flat files offered. And that's a good thing. That allows us to combine this data all sorts of different ways. Now, just calling a field by the same name doesn't make it a foreign key. So if I create a foreign key in a table and I just call it faculty ID, that in itself doesn't make it a foreign key. I have to actually go and say, hey, this is a foreign key. And if I do that, then that foreign key relationship is, is established. Okay. I said we would do a little bit of database theory, we'll do a little bit of SQL, and then we'll do a little bit of .NET. I'm going to start with a little bit of SQL with the last couple of minutes today. And then we will finish up some SQL and do uh, some ASP.NET next time. Then we'll talk more about the theory and so on. Okay. What is the basic let's let's add another field in here. What a foreign key between 
faculty person and a department. So, can't have a faculty member that has an invalid department. The other thing I'm going to add to this is I'm going to say this table has a class ID, just because all tables should have a foreign, uh, I'm sorry, should have a primary key. Now, if I want to get a list of all the faculty members, what is the SQL statement that will give that to me? SQL is a language for querying and manipulating databases. What is the statement in SQL to give me a list of all of the faculty members, every piece of information? Select asterisk. Select asterisk. And just a little bit more. I heard two things. I just said like where, wherever you're okay. looking at. Okay. You said table, faculty, close. From, from faculty to you. From faculty, right. So if I wanted to pull every faculty member out of this table, the SQL statement would be select asterisk from faculty. All right? So, you know, in the, in the upcoming weeks, if I say, what's the statement to query the database and give me something? If you don't know anything else, yell out select. Because all the queries start with select. All right? So, you'll get credit for that, and then I'll ask someone else for the rest of the statement. All right, so that's a good good trick to, to pull. So queries start with the word select. We then have a list of columns. That we pull. Asterisk simply means that we want a list of all columns. So we don't have to specify we want this, we want that, we want that, we want that. From appears in this position after the list of columns. And then finally, we have the table or tables that we're interested in, that we want to pull the data from. So, if I want to pull everything from the class table, let's say select star from class. <coughs> Excuse me. If I was only interested in certain fields, I could put them out. Like, if I only wanted to see the faculty's first name, last name, and email, I could say select Faculty, first name, faculty, last name, and email from faculty. Because remember, the second spot in the select statement after the word select is a list of col columns. And if we put an asterisk there, it means everything. Or we can enumerate the columns. If we enumerate them, there are commas between them. There's not commas after the last one. We then have the word from, then we have the table or tables that we want. All right? Someone had mentioned a where clause before. What is a where clause? What does a where clause do? It gets specific. Right, it gets specific. Without a where clause, how many rows are we going to get out of this? How many faculty members are we going to get? All of them. All of them, exactly. If we don't specify which one we want, we get all of them. So, this would give us a list for every row. When I talk about a row in the database, I mean an individual... <coughs> member of that entity. 
one uh, um, row in that, one record in that table. Now, if I throw a WHERE clause on here, where department ID equals 12, let's say, that will only give me uh, it'll only give me um, those faculty members that are in Department 12. What if there aren't any faculty members in Department 12? What will it give me? Sorry, what did you say? Uh, nothing. It will give you nothing. It's kind of a dumb question, right? Here's the point I was getting at, though. Here's what I intended to get at. It won't give you an error. All right? So, like, if 12, there, if 12 was a bogus number, there was no such thing as Department 12. That wouldn't give you an error. All right? That would simply return nothing. Because in the database's mind, if we're going to talk about the database as, as, like, having a mind, it did its job. It gave you every faculty person has a department of 12. Well, there aren't any, so it didn't give you any. So it did its job successfully, and therefore that would not be an error. What order will these come in? What order will these faculty members be displayed in? Yes? The, the, the row, they're, they, they're in the order of what row they're actually in the table itself? Is there oh. some sort of okay. More or less, yes. All right. This is, in a way, a bit of a trick question. The order that it's going to appear in is actually unpredictable. It is whatever the database feels like doing. Typically, the database is going to do one of two things. It's either going to put it in primary key order. I think that's what access does. Or will put it in position in the order that it was added. All right, so, but the bottom line is it's unpredictable. You don't know what order it's going to come back in, all right? Or you might as well act like you don't know what order it's going to be in. The bottom line is if you want it to be in a specific order, you need to specify, all right? Because if you do that, it'll give it to you in some order, and that order may or may not make sense to you. So if I wanted it sorted by... Last name, first name, I would say order by faculty F name, faculty, actually faculty L name, faculty F name. Notice how like in the, in the database some of these letters are capitalized, but when I write out the command here, they're not. The column names are, are not case sensitive, so it doesn't really matter. Now, the clauses of this select statement appear in a certain order, all right? And it's the order that I put them in. Select, list of columns. From, list of tables. Where clause, my condition. Order by, a list of things. All right? So I couldn't switch the where clause in the order by. All right. I didn't make that rule. I'm just telling you what it is. All right. So don't blame me that that seems arbitrary. It has to be in a certain order. Okay. I think that's enough for today. Next time we will probably talk a little bit more about select statements and we'll actually do some of this stuff. Create a little access database and retrieve data from it. Any questions? All right. I'll go unlock the door for lab, and then I will be back to grab gather my files, and then I'll be back at lab.